Join us now for the First Baptist Radio Broadcast with Dr. Wade Stevens, pastor of First Baptist Church in Mathiston. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn together this morning to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, beginning in verse number 44. Luke 24, 44. We'll put an end on our series in the Gospel of Luke in the time that we have together this morning. We have come a long way in our study of Luke's Gospel. We began some time ago a reading of the miraculous conception and virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, of how his coming was heralded by John the Baptist, how he battled temptation in the wilderness against the forces of Satan and even the weakness of human flesh, how he performed miracles, extraordinary miracles, even at one point feeding 5,000 with two fish and five loaves, how he gave sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf, speech to the mute, and cast out demons from those oppressed and possessed by the minions of Satan. How he worked powerfully through his teaching, and many had their hearts turned to him in faith, were saved, forgiven of their sin. We have studied how, even at the declaration of his innocence by Gentile rulers, and the meek acknowledgement of some of the Jews, He was crucified, not for his sin, but for ours. Jesus bore the penalty of mankind's sin on the cross, that all who would believe would come under the atoning power of his blood. We read and studied of his burial in a borrowed grave outside the city of Jerusalem. And in the past few weeks, we've considered together the vacancy of that grave, that Jesus has been raised again that he lives, that he rules, that he reigns. In our text this morning, we read and study of the ascension of Christ to the right hand of the Father, a position of power. As he says in Matthew 28, all authority has been given unto him in heaven and on earth. He is indeed the Lord of every Lord, the King of every King. And here in the last few verses of Luke's gospel, we learn something of how this resulted in the life of the disciples and how the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ, how the power of what God has done on our behalf in the sending forth of his son as the sacrificial lamb who would pay the price for our sin is to result in the lives of those who hear and believe. Look at verse 44. Here the Bible says, Then he told them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And look, I'm sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you're empowered from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. After worshiping him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple complex praising God. The first intended result of Luke's presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that you would believe. That's how the resurrection resulted in the lives of the disciples, that they believed. In verse 44, Jesus instructs them, instructs them these are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. In, in spite of Jesus' resurrection, he is aware and informs the disciples so that they'd be aware that the relationship the communion, the fellowship that they have enjoyed is going to change drastically upon his ascension. We don't have the benefit of the physical Lord Jesus' presence at our side, but we have the ever-present indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says it's going to be different. There were things that I told you while I was with you physically present that you're going to have to lean on now in my physical absence and my spiritual presence. 
that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Jesus has already instructed them as to how the Old Testament testifies of Jesus. And we've looked over the last couple of weeks at a number of examples of Old Testament texts that point to Jesus and the fulfillment of every Old Testament promise found in the person and the work of Jesus. He is all we'd ever needed. He is all we ought to have ever wanted. And in spite of our having rejected him out of hand, he was willing to bear the brunt of our guilt, to drink the bitter cup of God's wrath against us, that the curse of Adam would be reversed, that we'd find a new covenantal head in Jesus. In the same way that sin entered the world through one man, Adam, now righteousness enters our members through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He walked them through the Old Testament and he instructed them in how he was what we had been anticipating when there was no authority in Israel. In the period of the judges, when every man did what was right in his own eyes and with every passing passing season, with every new chapter in the history of Israel, there was an anticipation for, a looking for, a deliverer to relieve us of the wrath of God that had come. Christ is our great hero. In the period of the kings when there was this constant looking for the next king that would be for us what we so needed in a king, Christ comes as king over all kings, Lord over all lords. The fall of Jerusalem and the demise of the nation of Israel where there's this constant looking about for one, a remaining remnant of the house and line of David. Jesus comes not only as the son of David, but as the son of God. When there could be no remedy for our sin, Jesus comes and does the impossible on our behalf at the letting of his blood atoning for our sin. He taught them what the Bible says through Moses, through the prophets, and the Psalms, and connected the dots of their fulfillment found in his life. He really really does something of what J.B. illustrated in his illustration. Did you catch my child looking back? affirming to me what J.B. was describing with the lost stuff. J.B.'s illustration in Kids' Corner described every morning at my house when it comes to shoes. It's amazing how something can be laying out in the wide open and they can't see it. I've looked everywhere. I've looked all over the place. And, th- and, there, and there it is. Jesus instructs them to look at what is laying out in the wide open. What is so apparent? What would be so readily found? Here it is. See and observe in the scriptures how our hope, our expectation, our all is found in Jesus. In verse 45, Luke very eloquently describes what Jesus does. He says, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Here the disciples believe in a way that they had not before believed. I'm not suggesting that they were unconverted during the period of their ministry. But there's a greater degree of depth of belief enjoyed by the disciples at this moment than any other moment. I was teaching on on Friday night, Mark 8, where Peter makes his confession of Jesus as the Messiah. And in the following paragraph, he pulls Jesus aside after Jesus predicts his death and says, no, no, it mustn't be this way. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Peter is confessing that Jesus is the Christ without fully understanding the consequences of that confession. Even after repeated predictions by Jesus himself of his own death and resurrection, it is Peter that runs, perhaps optimistically, but Peter who runs first to the tomb of Jesus to see if the report of Mary and the other women could possibly be true. At the resurrection of Jesus, there is a heightened degree of belief in the hearts of the disciples in the lordship of Jesus Christ. If there is anything that is to result from our study of the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is that the faith of the people of God be enhanced in the power of God that abides within the body of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. 
If there is any goal that Luke has in mind when he inspired, puts pen to paper to record for us an orderly account of the life and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is that those who would hear would believe on the gospel for the salvation of their soul. The call of Luke's gospel, the call of the gospel to believers and unbelievers alike is to believe, 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 believe. I was looking back this morning, in fact, at Luke 1, 1 through 4, where Luke describes what he intends to do. He's writing to a specific per- person, probably a Gentile official of some sort named Theophilus. And he says, I've set out to write for you an orderly account of that which you have been instructed in. Luke's gospel has one of two, perhaps both of these focuses or points of emphasis. One, he is either writing to a Theophilus who has believed to strengthen his faith, or two, he's writing to a Theophilus who has heard but has yet to believe. The Gospel of Luke can operate on both of those levels simultaneously. And in fact, I believe it is God's intent that it does operate in that manner this morning in this gathering on both of those levels. That the church of Jesus Christ would believe with greater depth in the power of our Savior. And that every person here, separated from God by their own sin, without a saving relationship in Jesus, would look toward the cross of Christ to know that they're in a place of desperation and despair apart from that cross. And look at the same time beyond the cross to an empty grave at hope everlasting that's found only in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is to result first and foremost in our lives, in saving faith, that we would trust in him and believe. Folks, can I tell you, there'll there'll come a point in time in every mortal man's existence when he or she does believe. It'll happen within the span of your natural life. You'll come to the end of yourself, to the realization that you're broken, desperately sinful, that only God can remedy that problem in your life. That he's good, you're bad, you're bound for hell, but desire for heaven and only Christ can change your destiny. You may come to that realization within your mortal life and look to Jesus for salvation and forgiveness and you'll find it in his blood. Or you may find it on the other side of this mortal life when opportunity for repentance and salvation has passed and you realize your desperate need, only on this occasion it's everlastingly too late. There will come a day when every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. There is an urgency about the gospel as it's presented here in our text that you must believe that today is the day of salvation today is the day of salvation luke says luke pleads believe 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 in verse 46 the bible says he also said to them this is what is written the messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day and repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at jerusalem here Luke states this proclamation statement, this description of how the gospel will be preached a little differently than it's found elsewhere, but in a manner that I greatly appreciate. He says, Christ would suffer and rise from the dead the third day, that is the gospel, and repentance for forgiveness of sin would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. I want you to focus for a moment on the phrase, repentance for forgiveness of sin. There is this little prepositional phrase for forgiveness of sin that qualifies the notion of repentance. Repentance must be preached, but repentance in and of itself is not the gospel. In fact, there's a specific strain of repentance that the gospel calls us to, a repentance that results in the forgiveness of sin. This is more than a sadness or a sorrow over what we've done, often which can be confused with a sadness or a sorrow that we have to cease doing what we have been doing. That can often be the case. 
This is a level of repentance. This is synonymous with what Jesus describes when he calls us to belief. He's calling us to a level of belief that results in repentance for the forgiveness of sin in our life. When he calls us to repentance for the forgiveness of sin, he is at the same time calling us to a level of belief that again would result in the salvation of our soul. Turn away from your sins. Same word that's often translated as conversion or converted in the New Testament. Be transformed. Let the old man die and a new man be raised in his place. This is the message that is to be preached to the uttermost parts of the world. Repentance for the forgiveness of sin found only in Jesus who lived, who died for our sin, who rose again the third day. Repentance for the forgiveness of sin unlocks within our lives the glories of the gospel found in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Believe and repent. This is the message that we carry forth. And Luke's statement of the gospel and how it is to result in our life helps us with regards to our own unique responsibility in advancing the gospel. You're going to have to, where you live, with those with whom you share in conversation about the gospel, you're going to have to insist on a greater degree of depth in faith and repentance than people are customary to hearing or accustomed to hearing. There's just this superficial kind of belief and a superficial understanding of repentance that is prevalent in the world around us, and you're going to have to militate against that in your efforts at evangelism. We can just jump forward just a a phrase or two here. The gospel of Jesus Christ should result not only in your belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ, but in your testifying to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are to believe and you are to bear witness to the power of the gospel. You are to believe and you are to witness. When you come to believe, in fact, I think, I think our engagement in evangelism, our participation in witnessing to the power of the gospel is a pretty good barometer at where we are in terms of our faith. If you do believe, you will share the good news of the gospel with those you come in contact with. I I think it's pretty simplistic. I I don't think it's a matter of needing to better train people. I don't think it's a matter of, of, of getting better information in the hands of the people. I don't think it's a breakdown in our methodology that keeps us from sharing the gospel. I think it's an absence of, of a hot hearted love for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you really believe that the gospel has rescued you from the muck and the mire of your sinful life, has picked you up out of the kingdom of darkness and put your feet down as a citizen in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ has rescued you from an eternal hell and saved you for an eternal heaven in the presence of Jesus, If you really believe in your heart of hearts that the gospel of Jesus Christ has purged your heart of blackness and put within you the presence of the Holy Spirit of God, there is no way that you could be more excited about your hobbies and special interests than you are about the gospel of Jesus Christ. There ought to be a a natural overflow of gladness and joy that results in our proclamation of the gospel. Jesus says, tell them that Christ suffered, that he died, that he rose from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sin is necessary, that they would enjoy the fruit of the gospel. This is the message that we preach anywhere and everywhere at all times. This is to be proclaimed to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You start here and you go out and you share with all nations. Without partiality, without prejudice, you go and you take the good news of the gospel to anyone who will hear. Every occasion, every opportunity, our life is revolving around this notion of making sure that we get the good seed of the gospel into the hearts of every person we possibly can so that we're capitalizing on our vacation opportunities, so that we're capitalizing on our interaction with others, doing the things that we perhaps enjoy in an earthly way, recreating together, playing games together, involving in, involving ourselves in recreational sports or cheering for our favorite teams. We are leveraging every opportunity, every occasion, every like interest or similarity with someone else to ensure that they know that Jesus Christ is the only hope of salvation 
and that they are, apart from Christ, in desperate danger of an eternal hell. This is the business of every believer. It seems so simplistic. It's something that we hear. It's a constant refrain within Baptist life, but it's something that we cannot cease to be reminded of. We need to know, reprogram our lives. It seems each and every day Satan is at work, busying our schedules, distracting us with other things, perhaps directing our attention toward other noble but less noble causes. Nothing matters more for the believer than advance the kingdom of God through the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is who we are. This is who we are. There is no category anywhere in the New Testament for an unevangelistic believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We believe and we witness. But there's encouragement here in our witness and that we don't go it alone. We're not left to our own devices. We're not left to the power of personality. We're not left to our own natural charisma. Jesus says, you go back to the city of Jerusalem and you wait there. You don't go on your own. You don't go in your own power. It'll only result in the fruit of your own natural ability, should you choose to do so. You wait for the promise of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit of God. And and that's what they did. In Acts 1 and 2, there there is the coming of the Holy Spirit. And there is the proclamation of the gospel under the power of that Spirit. And there are scores of people who believe. Now here we are in the 21st century, in the Western world, in a day and an age when we have more resources, more technology, more techniques than we've ever had before. And somewhere along the way, we've grown increasingly reliant on the technology and the techniques and the newfangled methodologies and less reliant on the work of the Holy Spirit. There's a story, I don't know that anyone knows whether it's true or not, but there's a story of St. Augustine who's in the city of Rome and he's in conversation with the Pope in the fourth century. And they're, they're looking at St. Peter's Basilica And the Pope says to him, no longer can we say silver and gold, I have not. And Augustine responds to the Pope, yes, and no longer can we say arise and walk in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is something about a growing dependency on our natural ability or the things of this world that necessarily decreases our reliance on the power of the Spirit. And often what we're getting in our evangelistic efforts and in many of our churches is just exactly what we can muster in our natural ability without a wisp of the presence of the Spirit of God. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that Jesus has promised us the gift of the Holy Spirit to empower and enable our ministries. You may feel as though you are ill-equipped. You may feel as though you don't have the adequate gifts to be about the business of sharing the gospel. And if that's the feeling you have in your heart this morning, I want you to know that you are are precisely where the Lord would have you to be to be used in the most magnificent of ways. Because none of us have that ability. None of us have the, the depth of insight necessary to be about such an eternally significant business. Yet God has promised that he would provide us with the words, with the opportunity, and the harvest in due time if we would determine to give our lives over for the advancement of the gospel. The gospel only came to you because it was headed to someone else. Our mission in this life is to get the good news into the ears of all who will hear. We're no longer waiting on the promise of the Father on the coming of the Spirit. We enjoy His presence even now. Utilize the gifts, the abilities, the power that God has given you, not those natural gifts and abilities, but those which are the product of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your life. We are to believe. We are to witness. Third and lastly, we are to worship. Verse 50. He led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up His hands, He blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. And after worshiping him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple complex praising God. All of these go together. You, 
you won't have belief without witnessing and worship. You won't have worship without believing and witnessing. In fact, worship happens best in a scenario where the church, believing the gospel, has been actively participating throughout the week in exhorting others to believe the gospel by their witness. And then the church gathers on the Lord's day to sigh, to rest from their week of labor, to share with one another in the fruit of their harvest, and to give God the thanks for the way He's been pleased to work and move through their ministry in the days behind them. You'll never believe more in the power of the gospel than when you're actively engaged in sharing the good news of the gospel. And you'll never worship with greater spirit or truth than when you're worshiping out of the overflow of the experience of of life poured out in service to the King of Kings. Jesus ascended to the right hand of God and they worshiped with great joy. Their confusion had been set aside. Only days ago, they had been in despair at the death of their Savior, but now their confusion and their sorrow was turned to gladness. They come back to the city with great joy, continually in the temple complex, praising God. They went to church, and they, and they seemed to stay there. That's not to suggest that you have to stay in church to stay in a position of worship or to stay in a worshipful posture or to worship in any way, shape, form, or fashion. The, the notion of worshiping apart from the gathering of the church is a silly concept which doesn't find its place in the new testament but the idea that you can't worship outside of church is just as silly as the idea that you don't need the church to worship in we find ourselves worshiping wherever the lord sends sends us and and we worship best in light of what he has done for us actively engaged in the work of of ministry believe and witness and worship the resurrected christ our Savior lives. Have you trusted in Him? Have you believed in His name? Church folks, don't you believe that there's power in our acknowledging the resurrected Jesus? Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. Will you trust and believe in Jesus? Have you turned your heart toward Him? Do you love Him? Have you found salvation in him? Church folks, are you actively engaged in sharing the good news of the gospel? Evangelism is not for 400 level believers. It, 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 is, it is for every person who has believed from the moment of your conversion to the moment of your death. The responsibility of every believer is to shout from the wall as the watchman of Ezekiel 33 that danger, judgment, wrath is coming and hope is only found in the person of Jesus. Let's bow and pray. Father, thank you for your word and for its truth, for the gift of saving grace and for the continued work of sanctifying grace in each of our lives. We're not where you'd have us to be, But thank God, through the work of your Spirit, we're we're not where we used to be either. Lord, I, I pray that this morning you would call us to respond appropriately to the beauty of the gospel. But Lord, there'd be some here who would believe for the first time, and still others who would believe yet again that they would grow in grace and knowledge, maturity in the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us, Lord, exhort us through the work of your Spirit to be about the business of evangelism, and that in all of us, in all of this, and in all of us, Lord, the name of Jesus would be lifted high and greatly praised. Lord, we ask these things in the power of His name. Amen. You've been listening to the First Baptist Radio Broadcast with Dr. Wade Stevens. Hello, I'm Wade Stevens, pastor of First Baptist Church in Matheston. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. Join us next week at 10 a.m. for another message from God's Word. If you don't have a church home, I invite you to worship with us this Sunday. Service is at 10 a.m. The church is located near the corner of Highways 15 and 82 in Matheston. 
You may follow us on Facebook at First Baptist Matheson, and for more information, check out our website at firstmatheson.com or call us at 662-263-5323.